Hello and welcome to New York. Uh, my name is Anton Creel. I'm the managing partner of the Institute of Trading and Portfolio Management. I'm joined here today with one of our senior trading mentors, Raj Malhotra. And Raj started working for the Institute uh, last year, helping us to teach and mentor uh, retail traders in the financial markets to become more consistently profitable. And uh, welcome to the interview, Raj. Thank you, Anton. So Raj, why don't we start right at the beginning uh, of your career, how things developed uh, throughout your career? Where did it all begin? Okay. Well, I started trading stocks in high school on my old Lotus 123 spreadsheet. And that's when I decided I, know I, I knew that I wanted to work on Wall Street. So I attended the uh, Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, and I graduated in 90, 1998. And then from there, I joined the uh, hedge fund that was owned by BNP Paribas, trading S&P 500 index options. From there, I, from 2000, they moved me to their New York office, and I was trading options for the, the firm as well as uh, customers until 2002. 2002, I was hired away by Bank of America to be the head of index options. And in 2006, I was named head of all institutional options trading until 2009 when I left Bank of America to join Nomura, in which I, where, where I worked until 2012. So I guess my career spanned three different continents, Europe, Asia, and uh, America. Okay, so a pretty successful career then. Yes. Um, what's quite interesting is you and I started uh, pretty much at the same time. So in the late 90s, at the beginning of the tech boom. Uh, what was it like uh, starting and working as a young guy on the trading desk at that time? Well, it was, it was a great time because at that time you thought everything would go up forever. Yeah. I mean, I started during the, one of the biggest bull markets ever. And so I saw that cycle. And then fast forward to 2008, I saw the greatest bear market ever. So I've been through the ups and the downs and I've seen it all, I guess. You'd see these guys make hundreds of million dollars of paper wealth and all of a sudden they have nothing. So it was, um, it was pretty, ex it was um, exciting, but also humbling. Okay. So what was the, uh, what was the options market like to trade at that time? Well, it was crazy. I remember one time I priced a collar for the, uh, the girlfriend of a CEO of one of these companies. She wanted to call it, she, her allocation was 200,000 shares. And the stock price, I remember when we first looked at it, was around 220. And her put price was 150. So at worst, she would walk away with $30 million. And when she came in, the stock was down 20 bucks. So she got greedy and said, I want to wait till the stock's back up to 220. And the stock went straight to zero. So she walked away with nothing. My God. So it was my first lesson in greed. Okay. So you traded through that cycle, uh, you saw the boom, you saw the bust, mm -hmm. you saw the greed on Wall Street, you saw the fear on Wall Street. Then we kind of took off on a slow grind bull market, 02, 03, up to 07, escalating into the financial crisis in 08. What was it like for you uh, to trade that period up to the financial crisis? 02 to 07 was great for the most part. There were good trading opportunities, but you did see the cracks coming. Um, I would say around 2006, it was pretty apparent that uh, something wasn't right. And the hard part about that was getting the timing right. Yeah. Because it, it didn't, it was a year, really a year, a year and a half before everything really crumbled. And then when it crumbled, it was like a game of Jenga. You pull out one thing and everything falls. It's like a house of cards. So in 2006, what were the cracks that were starting to appear that you were talking about? Well, the assumption that all real estate would go up forever was the first sign of a crack. The assumption was that everything was let, secured because the, the market was always going up. So if you could foreclose on, a bank could foreclose on something, but they didn't care because if they foreclosed on it, they would, they would, they could sell it for more. And you know, you could see the real estate bubble bursting. You saw banks' balance sheets have bad bets on that they just couldn't move. And that was, that was the beginning of the end. Okay, so obviously you were running the options book at Bank of America at the time. Yes. With all the conversations that you were having, how were you actually 
structuring things in the market at that time? What were you doing? Well, we, we got very defensive on the markets. And and then since we had a, a global bank, a big risk, we had risk across all assets. We could see in other, in other assets like um, mortgages and a lot of these structured products and credit markets, they were getting very bearish. So the equity market was almost the last one to see okay. the cracks happen. Okay, so you were obviously on the equity side at the time. Yes. Um, what was the communication like between uh, the equities department and the fixed income department? So the typical investment bank, obviously they had uh, the huge exposures to the subprime market. Uh, what was it like communicating between the two uh, areas of the bank at the time? Yeah, what we would do is we'd have weekly risk meetings and all the heads of products would meet and then talk about positions and what they're seeing. And that helped us position ourselves correctly in the equity market for the coming Armageddon. Okay, so when the Armageddon finally did come and the cracks did open, uh, what was it like internally at Bank of America at the time? Obviously, they were a very big player during the financial crisis as we, as we saw and as things unfolded. What was it like there at the time? I mean, I, it was chaos across all, not just Bank of America, across all Wall Street firms. Yeah. Granted, Bank of America wasn't as, um, wasn't as hurt by the credit markets as because of the balance sheet. But um, our, our C also made bad investments. He bought Countrywide at the wrong time. Yeah. He bought Merrill Lynch when Merrill Lynch was really worthless. Mm-hmm. And so he didn't really get the memo, but the professionals <laughs> definitely knew what was going on. Okay. And uh, we, were, we were well positioned for the most part. So as far as the fallout and what happened after, um, obviously there was Bear Stearns, there was Lehman Brothers, uh, Bank of America were obviously a relative survivor, doing pretty well out of the whole situation. Um, you were at Bank of America for another few years, then you went to Nomura? No, what, what happened was when, when Merrill Lynch and Bank of America merged, yeah. which was essentially a Merrill takeover of Bank of America securities, Merrill decided to just keep all their employees and okay. Bank of America was no longer needed. So I, so me, I moved my team to Nomura and okay. we were there for about three years. We we uh, helped them launch their U.S. presence, yeah. and I retired in 2012 and walk away very happy with a lot of friends still there nice. and wish them, I hope they become the next yeah. Bank of America. Okay, so around 2010, 2011, uh, you were starting to bed yourself in at Nomura. Yes. What was it like actually working at a Japanese bank? versus a mainstream Wall Street bank like uh, Bank of America? Well, it was just a little bit of a cultural difference. There were, um, you know, that the, the, uh, Nomura wanted to be as uh, hands off, just let America run the American business. But there were always uh, some Japanese influence. But I, had, but I have nothing but great things to say about uh, the people I work with at Nomura. They were, uh, they were aggressive. They, they also bought Lehman. At the same time they acquired us, they also bought Lehman's business in Europe. Yeah. So they were, you know, they, they really wanted to make a presence. They really wanted to make a push in the US also. So I think the uh, famous story uh, in Europe is the, um, the Lehman guys there uh, getting their bonuses guaranteed for two years by Nomura after the buyout. I'm pretty sure they were happy with that. I'm sure they were. <laughs> <laughs> So you came out of the financial markets uh, pretty happy in 2012. What was it actually like uh, to leave the markets and the whole readjustment process when you woke up the next day and realized uh, there was nowhere to go? A little bit refreshing, but also a little scary at the same time. Sure. I mean, it was, it was uh, refreshing because I could actually uh, sleep at night. Yeah. Without waking up every day and check my Bloomberg of course. every hour, see where futures are, especially yeah. during 2008. Yeah. Half the time, you couldn't even believe the numbers. Like, wait, that's down how many points? Yeah. Okay, so you've obviously been uh, chilling out a lot more since 2012. And I personally know what it's like, you know, to leave the markets 
and uh, have that moment of realization when you wake up and you don't have anywhere to go. Um, but you and I got in touch uh, recently and started discussing uh, how you could help retail traders uh, in the United States become a lot more consistently profitable. Yes. Um, what are the types of guys that you get coming to the seminars uh, in New York? Uh, what are they? What are they like? What are they looking for? Okay, I think there's two type of uh, traders that I really, when I look into a room, like this, this, there's two types of guys I want to mentor that I that I think are very successful. Um, number one is a guy that's maybe a little bit older, has been trading his account for a while, and yeah. he's had marginal success, but the, the difference, is, the reason he hasn't been successful is because he doesn't have the right education or know exactly what the markets are telling you. Usually this person is, well, he owns, his own, he owns his own business or has been successful in business somewhere, so he's acquired a bit of wealth, but he just needs that extra education, that extra guidance to actually become a successful trader because his instincts are actually correct most of the time. He just needs a little bit more guidance or a little push or whatever just to get him over the hump. Yeah, so we have a similar problem in Europe. Uh, we tend to get a lot of guys, I guess, who have been around the market uh, 10, 20 years. So been on the retail trading side for a long time. Yep. And either they've uh, lost money consistently or had marginal successes where they do make a decent return occasionally, but they never manage to actually sustain it. Yeah, I think the problem with them is sometimes they just overtrade yeah. or they undertrade. They don't have the optimal amount of, tra you know, it, if you if they look at 20 bets, uh, they either don't put any of them on or they put on too many of them. They should pick the three or four winners, the okay. three or four best. Okay, so obviously the infrastructure uh, in Europe and Asia in the retail trader market uh, is very different uh, to the United States. Obviously, in Europe and Asia, the infrastructure that retail traders use uh, is contracts for difference, CFDs. And in the United States, the way retail traders leverage positions is primarily through options. Uh, with your background in the options market, uh, what do you think are the main mistakes or problems that retail traders have in the options market? I think what they get wrong is they're not telling you what they miss what the options volatility is actually telling you. Like if they're, if a vol, maybe they don't have a basic understanding of what volatility is or when they see volatility high or whether when they see it low, usually it's high for a good reason and it's low for a reason. You usually want to buy vol when it's on an, when it's going up and sell vol on the winds going down. It's the same thing actually with stocks. You, you want to you yeah. catch that. So if there's momentum in the same direction. Yes, that's right. why, yes, I think that's what a lot of the uh, retail investors miss. Okay, so uh, retail traders looking at low vol, um, thinking because vol is low that it's an indication to buy because it will be higher at some point. Yes. And then uh, they just get, I guess, major decay. Right, there's a difference between being low and being cheap. Sure. When vol, vol is low, it doesn't make it cheap. Usually, usually when vol is high, that's when it's cheap. And when it's low, that's when it's expensive. Okay. It's the opposite of what they, yeah, yeah, yeah. of their instincts. Okay, so interacting uh, with these guys in seminars and through the mentoring programs so far, um, we've obviously talked about the classic mistakes that retail traders make in the options markets. What about successes? What are the types of uh, options trades that guys tend to get right consistently? I think what the, the ones that they get right are, like I said, the guys that have that understanding of when vol is high, probably because there's a catalyst, whether earnings are coming out or there's a uh, FDA decision coming out, that's okay. when you want to buy the okay. vol. It, so, because it also limits your downside. If, you, if you're totally wrong, you don't lose as much as you would if you're just owning stock by trading options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And your levered bet can you can make more money, and that's that's the that's what I've seen as the successes so far. Okay, so you've obviously talked about uh, the older guys, the guys that have been around the block uh, a number of times uh, in the retail trader options market in the U.S. 
and either lost money consistently or had marginal success and never made it uh, sustainable. What about the other group of guys that you mentioned? Okay, the other guys I like to mentor are guys that are young and hungry, guys like myself before they uh, started working on Wall Street. Uh, for whatever reason, Wall Street tends to only hire from a certain group of schools. And a lot of times the guy that's way more successful is, comes from a, what they call a B tier two school, but are much hungrier and much, uh, much hungrier and more willing to learn sure. and understand that um, the market doesn't care where you went to college. Yeah, I mean, to my knowledge, uh, the most successful guys on Wall Street, uh, whether that's in the old days at investment banks or even now uh, the most successful hedge fund managers, uh, they're all the guys who uh, at a young age built their own track records and traded with their own money. Right. I'd, I'd prefer like um, I prefer a guy that comes in hungry and willing to learn because if you come in with a blank slate, that's, that's better. That, that's the best way to learn. Okay, so obviously uh, Wall Street tends to hire from specific schools. Um, what advice would you give to the guys who have gone to tier two colleges or guys who have never been to college at all? Well, I think if you, if you uh, join the Institute, um, number one, we, we teach you how to, the same thing they teach you at Goldman Sachs. Yes, you have something audited where it's like, okay, this, yeah. I've made this much money trading and here are the trades I've done yeah. rather than some fictional trading account. This is a real trading account. This is real money. I made real decisions and I'm, I'm ahead of the game, ahead of the other guys that have just uh, been yeah. following their books. <laughs> and they're much more marketable and hireable as soon as they walk into a investment bank or a hedge fund. Sure. So you've moved from there into the Institute. Uh, what are the classic mistakes that you see from retail traders at the beginning of mentoring programs? I think some of the classic mistakes are over trading and doing trades where they don't really haven't done their research, haven't really done their homework. Okay, so when we're going into a catalyst, for example, like uh, earnings, two or three weeks before earnings, um, I generally tend to find that retail guys don't really have any reason with an edge as to why they're playing that catalyst. So maybe they think they're going to beat earnings uh, for a reason that they may have read in an article, but it's already priced into the stock. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give the retail trader uh, who's trading catalysts in terms of looking forward and looking beyond uh, the nearest catalyst, so looking further out? Well, I look at... Um... I look at what companies are saying about them, about their own, about their industries in general. And when you read about what their industry is, what's the derivative of that? What's, if what they're saying is true, who wins? If, if Apple is saying we're going to sell X amount of iPhones next quarter, which is a much, which a lot more than they expect. Well, who benefits from that? Is it the, what, the guys that put in the uh, batteries, the other parts of that, that, that that's where you want to look. So you look down the value chain. Correct. At the second, third derivative. Exactly. Place. Okay. So what do you uh, tend to find yourself focusing on? Uh, are you looking at mispricings? Uh, are you looking at a catalyst? Are you looking at multiple catalysts? What do you tend to find yourself uh, focusing on the most? I, I would say that most options and markets aren't mispriced. I'm just looking at the, st I'm looking at the uh, stock itself and then using the options to, to express my view because it's a better way in a lot of, rather than just buying a stock or selling a stock often. Yeah. You get more leverage and if you're totally wrong, then you, you limit your downside. Good. Okay, and what about uh, positions in options on companies that you haven't had any interaction with? Uh, what do you look for in the fundamentals? What do you look for in the financials uh, before you take a position? Well, usually what I'll tell someone is if you don't know anything about the company or the sector, you probably should look elsewhere because there's so many stocks to choose from, so many sectors. You want to go where you think, where you have a basic understanding rather than just trying to play catch up. When, you read, when you're reading a company report and this stuff doesn't make any sense to you, how are you ever going to make money in that? You want to you be, tra be trading stuff that you know or 
as opposed to stuff you have no clue on. Like if you're if you're if you're gonna buy an engineering company, you know nothing about engineering, then all that stuff is uh, pig Latin. Okay. Whatever they say, I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so somebody comes into the market cold. How do they actually go about uh, researching these companies? Well, I think what you do is just just read up about the company, read up about everything that you, the, everything is available online. Everything is pretty free. You want to know about just you can read the company reports. You can you can see what the CEO says. You can re- go through financials. Everything is available now. That's what the yeah. great thing about the internet. Yeah. Back when I started, this stuff was hard to get. Yeah. Now it's now it's just putting in the time and effort. Yeah. So when you're taking guys, uh, your mentees through your processes, what do you actually show them to begin with? Well, the first thing that I tell them to do is look around what's going on in the world. That, that that's and that's how you develop your worldview. First, figure out like what apps kids are using. What how is behavior changing? What is go, how is the world different than five years ago? And then start looking at companies that will profit off the changing world. Because what, what happened in the past, you can, you can look at Polaroid, Camera, Blockbuster, Video. There's so many companies that don't, aren't relevant anymore. But then you have Snapchat. So look around the world, open your eyes, and then use that to develop your stock views. Um, what, do you, what, do you think, what do you think drives stocks the most? What's the most important thing? that you would look at? To drive a stock. Um, first of all, the world, your view on the world. Mm. And second of all, your view on the sector. Mm. Because, and then just know some, what trends, like who's gonna start, what sectors are gonna start doing better than others. Yeah. Start, so start, and then and then you drill down to the company. Like if you, if you wanna, if your company, the company you wanna buy is doing great, but in a sector that's declining, yeah. it doesn't make sense to be the tallest midget. You want to you want to be picking the best companies in the best sectors. Sure. Like you, you if you think uh, tech is, if you like the tech sector, just go go to a tech conference. Just see what's out there. See what people are using. Look around. What are what are young kids using? What what are they? What apps are they using? That's the that that's the best way to start is just to start looking at the world, and then you can figure out if your worldview was correct. Sure. Okay, well, Raj, it's, uh, it's a beautiful day today in New York. Yep. It would be a shame, really, to spend the whole day inside. Why don't we uh, go out for a little walk? All right, let's do it. Yeah. I'll show you my New York. So, Anton, we're in Bryant Park. Behind us is the Bank of America Tower, where I worked from 2002 to 2009, and it's the World Trading Headquarters. Okay, so you were Bank of America from 2002? Yes. Okay, so interesting, you you were there starting there right at the beginning of a bull market. Yeah, I caught, yeah, I caught the early part of the bull market from uh, 2002 to 2007. And I was also there when everything went south during the financial crisis. Yeah. Luckily, we were on the third floor, so it wasn't far to jump. <laughs> so how was that for you working there during that time? Uh, well, at Bank of America, it was great. That's where I had my greatest success. I was came in as head of index options trading. When I left, I was head of all institutional options trading. Yeah. I was also made a managing director before the age of 30, which is unheard of. Yeah. Wow, pretty incredible successes. Yeah, I'm very happy with the uh, work I did there. In yes. fact, I'm pretty sure I helped build that building. Yeah, okay. So, uh, in terms of uh, mentoring, Yes. When you were at Bank of America, yes, a uh, lot of young guys coming in, starting to work under you. Yep. Uh, what type of structures were in place? How did you actually help guys go through their careers? Well, what I would do is I was always look for the young, hungry guy, and I wanted him to work under me. I, I personally mentored him myself. I made sure that he followed the right processes to become a successful trader. And a lot of the guys I trained are sprinkled all over the street right now. Probably a lot of them still there as well. Yeah, some of them are still there. Okay. And plus other firms as well. Okay. So we're um, we're up in Midtown right now. Yes. And you were saying a lot of the a uh, lot of the banks have moved up here. Yeah. Within a 10-minute walk of here, you can get to Morgan Stanley, Barclays, J.P. Morgan, UBS, the French banks. If Lehman and Bear Stearns were still around, you could walk to their old offices as well. Okay. So all these guys have moved up from Wall Street. Yes. So uh, I mean. What's the, what's the reason why they've all kind of moved up here? Well, you know what? You don't really need to be near each other down in Wall Street like the old days. Since everything's done upstairs, everything's done electronically, the, the, the exchange is more of a museum now. Okay. Well, speaking of Wall Street, I think we're going to take a little wander down there. 
why don't we uh, why don't we get a, get a cab and go down Wall Street? All right, let's do it. Cool. Okay, so we're down by the New York Stock Exchange, next to Wall Street. Uh, this is where all the action happens in the financial markets globally. Uh, Raj, you were stationed down here uh, in this area when you went to work for Nomura post-financial crisis. What was it like to be there at the time? Did, op did uh, pessimism actually turn into optimism at the time? Well, it took a long time for the pessimism to turn into optimism, especially if you look at right here, we're um, right in the middle of the stock exchange, uh, the New York Fed, and now there's all these tourists. Back then, there was, this was a ghost town. No one wanted to be associated with the financial markets or anywhere near here. Okay. The, tra the atmosphere was very pessimistic. Everywhere, um, it was long faces. No one, uh, everyone thought the party was over. Everyone thought the stock market was dead. The economy was crashed. Um, there was all, all bad thoughts. And five years later, here we are. We're back to uh, the biggest bull market in history. So things change quickly. Yeah. The current situation now, I mean, looking around, it's as busy as I've ever seen the area. Yeah. Um, what do you think in terms of uh, the market now, investment banks, the infrastructure of financial markets? Do you, do you genuinely think we're actually uh, experiencing bull markets of bull markets past, or is this a different type of market? I think it's a different type of market. I, I think uh, the stock market's doing great, but. Um, the people in Wall Street aren't happy like they were in past bull markets because uh, they're just not making the amount of money that they did in the past. So yeah. it's a time to be more entrepreneurial rather than go and work for a big bank because it's just not, the risk reward isn't what it was in the previous bull markets. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, what I've certainly noticed in the last five years, this bull market's pretty different in terms of uh, being in the, on the sell side, the banking side. Yes. You know, everyone, uh, everyone I know who was actually big in the financial markets in the previous cycle has left. Yeah. And uh, it's a much more career ladder, occupational ladder, yeah. with predefined titles and yes. predefined pay at every level. Yes. Um, in terms of retail traders who are hoping to go into the financial markets, yeah. what, what, what advice would you give now in terms of where they should be going to work? What should they be concentrating on? Well, going to Wall Street is not the only way to make money anymore. The, the amount of information at your disposal is different than any other bull market. So you don't need to go to this, one of these institutions to make a lot of money. All the information is at your fingertips with the, uh, with, with the expansion of the uh, information on the internet. Retail traders have got it better yeah. than they've ever had it be ever before. I mean, I totally agree. If you look at the New York Stock Exchange behind us, it's basically just a museum now. They don't, they don't really do any actual trading there. It's all done electronically, it's all done upstairs. It's all, the, the ICE is actually based yeah, yeah, in yeah. Atlanta. So this is more of a, uh, this is more of a historical place sure. than, than, the, uh, than the current future that you can create for yourself. Hence all the tourists. Yes, exactly. Okay, let's go for a walk down okay. Wall Street. I guess back in 2008, nobody wanted to be anywhere near this bull. Now everyone, now, now the bull market's back. Everybody wants to be next to the bull. So I was here, did a couple of stints by Wall Street for Goldman. Yeah, it was good to work in this area. So Anton, I wanted to bring you here because this was the subway stop I used to go to and from work every day when I worked at Nomura. And then one day I just stopped coming here. And that was the end of that part of my life. Okay, so I guess this was uh, the end of the investment banking career, the end of that journey? Yep, it was the end of that journey, and uh, now I'm looking for the next thing. Fantastic. So I guess that's all about uh, joining the Institute, being a mentor to the retail traders, being a mentor to the, and teacher to the Institute traders, and uh, helping them, I guess, apply the knowledge that you acquired here. Yeah, I'm hoping to help them and have them well on their way to the same success that I had during my career. Fantastic. Well, uh, listen, Raj, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for taking the time out. It's been a great conversation and uh, I guess to many years of success in the future. Absolutely, looking forward to it.